for the opportunity to talk to you guys over here today. Uh, my name is Mahmoud Mirza. I'm uh, with Sarah Novus. And uh, today the topic that I was asked to speak on is primarily around medical devices and, and uh, how it works in the industry. Um, I, I chose a very specific uh, topic within that uh, so I could give a flavor of uh, of what happens in the medical device development and and the and the title is the role of in vitro modeling in the development of a medical device uh, i was asked uh, by by uh, ray to 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 give uh, to step in for this uh, for this slot and um, invited by lorian and so thank you for that normally i'm not part of the the group but i am with sarah novis and so happy to Happy to talk about these things. As I mentioned, I'm uh, I'm part of Serenovis specifically within the NTI team, and uh, uh, I'll I'll be using the backdrop of our medical device. The main medical device that we have is called the EmboTrap, which was designed and developed uh, in Galway at the Serenovis uh, R&D facility. So it'll. It will uh, not be device related, but of course, this is how this is one of the ways we use to develop the device. And so, it'll the, there might be a lot of uh, device terms or pictures shown throughout the presentation. Um, a little bit of background about myself. Actually, I'm a biomedical engineer uh, by by trade or by profession. I I uh, completed engineering in Canada. I started working in the R&D industry quite early and then uh, wanted to do medicine. So I did my medical school here in Ireland. And then afterwards was trying to combine the two and find a way to, to use both of my passions. And, and that's when I joined Neuravi at the time before Serenovis had been, uh, before Neuravi was acquired by Serenovis uh, within Johnson & Johnson. So kind of a brief history of, of the development cycle of EmboTrap. Um, you know, Neuravi itself was, um, was established as a startup company in 2010. And there was a business plan that was developed around a uh, kind of a device that would catch clots within, within the vessel. Uh, and for the first couple of years, a lot of prototyping, a lot of uh, understanding of the of, of the uh, stroke space on the bench was done. And uh, you know, we had we were uh, happy with a with a prototype device around 2012 mark, and then it took about a year to refine the device and design. Uh, and get it through regulatory approvals. And uh, so late in 2013 is when EmboTrap was officially CE marked um, the first generation of EmboTrap. And we did a very controlled launch within Europe for with five centers and monitored the patients very, very closely. Uh, even though it's not an implantable device, it's just a one use device, single use device used in the treatment of of, uh, of stroke and, and thrombectomy. Uh, it was um, very, um, uh, I suppose it, it um, uh, we, we felt responsible to monitor very closely uh, this brand new device that had come on the market uh, as, as we created this device. And we wanted to make sure that everything was meeting according to its expectations. So there was a very slow, purposeful launch in the uh, at the end of 2013, and then after we were quite satisfied with the safety and efficacy of the device, is when we actually launched it properly with a full marketing campaign uh, in in early 2015. After that, we, or I guess around this time, we as we gained confidence. We uh, uh, we, we also planned our entry into the U.S. market. And uh, at the time, um, there was there was no real thrombectomy device that was uh, that was um, uh, uh, well. There was a couple. Sorry, I should say that again. There were a couple. Trevo and Solitaire were the main devices that were approved in the U.S. And so we uh, we were able to launch a cl clinical trial called Arise Two, 
that that started in 2014, 2015 timeframe and finished in 2017, um, where we were able to establish the device uh, in, in the US uh, population. And, and when that completed, uh, Johnson & Johnson officially acquired us uh, from, uh, from um, Galway. At the time, we were about 28 employees in total. Uh, now we're approaching 100 in the four or five years that we've been with uh, Johnson & Johnson. So we've seen dramatic growth. And we now have had the ability to focus in on lots of different devices, uh, advance our EmboTrap technology, and also focus uh, on ancillary devices. A, a, in most medical device companies, there's you know, typically departments uh, or persons that focus on a lot of separate activities, um, including the R&D aspect, of course, but there's specialized people involved in regulatory teams to help get the device approved into the markets they want the device to be in. Um, supply chain is a, is a big uh, part of making sure that the device is being um, manufactured at high quality, uh, with, um, with, with, without any defects. Uh, early on in a startup's company or early on in a, in a medical device company's life, um, I think it's very important that the uh, supply chain is not super cost focused. And that's what I've noticed in, in my career, that it's not very cost focused, it's more quality focused. And once, once everything is well established, they can then start to, to look at costs very um, uh, appropriately. Uh, that doesn't mean that uh, you, know, you lose all sense of pro profitability. You do need people telling you uh, how to behave as a, as a startup company or as a well-functioning company. Um, marketing and commercial access is, of course, uh, very important to be able to sell your device uh, in, into, the, into the hands of the physicians. So there's a um, there usually there's two types of marketing groups that are in medical device companies. One is called a strategic marketing group, which is more focused on a longer term outlook on where the technology is heading, where new improvements should be made, um, and you know kind of a five year or or more outlook. Uh, whereas commercial access is more right away how to market. Uh, right now, uh, how to sell right now in, into the uh, into into the hospitals. Clinical trials is is very very important for new medical devices. Even established companies have um, have strong clinical trial departments because with regulations nowadays, clinical trials are a very big need for almost any uh, medical device in class two, class three um, area to to um, be able to get approved. And, and something that uh, uh, sometimes people don't uh, list out as a bullet point, but I, I think it's a very important bullet point here is the, is the talent of people. Um, it, it, especially in a startup environment, uh, the, the company has to gel together uh, in order to function well and, and be able to produce a device or, or really any product that, uh, that they believe in and has value. So I'd like to kind of share not everything here because I think number one, I don't have a full background on each of these components myself. That's why they're specialized people, but also it would take just uh, uh, a long time. There's courses to, you know, made to be able to teach all these different components. So I just wanted to kind of give a flavor of how uh, at Serenovus or at Niravi, we uh, developed our medical device, uh, particularly through the special use of, of our in vitro modeling technology. Uh, the approach that we've taken has been the same since we were a small startup company. And I think that's very important for us. We have really focused on understanding the unmet clinical need. It's always about going back to the going back to the clinical need, not not necessarily 
the perspective of a patient or a physician or or uh, some specific person, but uh, but a but an established need from from a scientific rationale. Uh, and this includes all sorts of interactions with physicians uh, at the congresses, learning, educating yourself, um, and, and, and going into the operating theaters and seeing the cases and aligning with strategic marketing, a, a group I spoke about before, which is really looking at, really trying to capture or understand how a, a device will be used in the long run, because the you may, we may have an idea now, but it takes years to actually develop a device around that idea and get it onto the market. Three, four, five years it could take. So early on in the, in the, in the understanding of an unmet need, we need to be very mindful of what will the market probably look like in five years time. And that's, that's extremely important before, before picking a, a, uh, a project to work on. Then the approach that we took was to develop a deep understanding of the of this unmet need, and that involved uh, researching, but also recreating and replicating the challenges that physicians are facing, particularly for us with thrombectomy, and that involved lots of components uh, looking at um, uh, images and scans of, of uh, challenging arteries and trying to replicate them. And as I'll show later on, uh, one of the most important parts is replicating the challenge of the clot itself. And, and we established an in-house expertise in order to be able to do this. Um, but there's always limitations to your own strengths. And so we collaborated with physicians and universities very early on to help us with, uh, with uh, researching this problem. Um, you know, that helped us to create new models and always innovating on the models in order to uh, learn more and more. Uh, and then that, all of this helps to translate the needs from the physician to the engineer. Because every, every uh, medicine itself is not a strict science because of the fact that humans are all very, very different from one another. No matter how much we try and control and take a, uh, a sample, a population and try to create parameters around, uh, around them, there will always be variations. And then on top of that, the variations from the physicians themselves make, uh, make, this, make procedures like this uh, have, have um, create variability in the procedures themselves and the outputs. And so strong models can really help to, uh, to coalesce different physician insights into something that's useful for an engineer to interpret and then to be able to design around it. Once, once we have a strong understanding, good models, uh, there's fast paced generation of multiple solutions, uh, in, innovation uh, uh, to, to create lots of different concepts um, uh, in, into, into meeting this unmet challenge. And so R&D is, th this is typically R&D where they're brainstorming and coming up with new ways and, uh, or old ways and trying to rehash them uh, and, uh, and trying to create a solution. Um, then the next step is to is to get the new product to the actual customers. And once once a product is made and we're satisfied with how the product functions and and uh, its safety and efficacy, um, now it's no longer a small team kind of creating models, working on them, interpreting and looking at designs and 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 making them. It's a multifunctional team where the where the uh, mindset changes uh, to how to so how to get this device into the hands of customers, uh, and um, and a new risk-focused mentality kind of comes up, and uh, we have to be able to manage the risks of a new medical device, uh, and and processes have to be very uh, 
openly created within the company in order to ensure that any any feedback that is received is always filtered and highlighted to management and to the people who are uh, 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 looking at these uh, looking at this product. So uh, it, it's because uh, the journey doesn't end at creating the medical device. Uh, early feedback is extremely important to be able to understand where the devices are working, where they are not, and it helps to pitch it in the right way. Uh, and then beyond that, you know, we we were not we ourselves as a, uh, were not satisfied at finishing there either. We kind of took one step further. This this I think is uh, something unique to us as Theranovis, where we have um, taken our models, our unique kind of insights into this area and uh, use that to generate evidence and also share that evidence and share the um, challenges very publicly. Uh, and uh, through, through this, we've been able to have uh, lots of insightful discussions with researchers such as yourselves that are on this call listening uh, physicians who are using this device um, and and other customers. And when I say customers, I mean you know uh, a, a customer for a company is not just the person who uses the device, but it is the hospital boards, the government agencies that are uh, allowing that are that have the um, responsibility to reimburse or not to reimburse a certain procedure. So all of those people become customers for the company. And, and being able to show uh, visually with evidence uh, and with strong research is, is uh, for a medical device company that's entering into a market that's not very well defined uh, is very, very important. So this kind of captures the way we have developed our device and how the in vitro modeling in particular has shaped how we have um, used that in vitro modeling to, to um, uh, not just develop the device, but get it into the hands of physicians, understand where things are working and not working, and, um, uh, uh, and help the market grow. So when I say we start with the clinical unmet need, you know, here's one way to represent the clinical unmet need. And th these are all of the thrombectomy trials that have taken place, the large thrombectomy trials uh, with core lab validated scores that have taken place since 2013. And the green shows successful recanalization and the pink shows failed recanalization. You can kind of steadily see, especially in the early 2013 to 2015 er, uh, area, there was a um, big growth uh, um, advancement in better recanalization. And then it's kind of slowed down, but still getting a little bit better. Uh, overall, though, we still see that maybe 20% of recanalizations are, are still failing. And so the R&D doesn't stop. Innovation doesn't stop here. We want to continue and develop um, this, uh, uh, this challenge as much as possible. So in, uh, in recreating the mechanical thrombectomy procedure, there indeed are a lot of factors and we can look at the, the, the anatomy itself, um, comorbidities and vessel disease, uh, the clot and the techniques to remove them. And, and indeed even probably other things that are not captured here in terms of the variables for success of mechanical thrombectomy. But a lot of the other things are already very well understood and can be replicated. Anatomy is, is very well replicated in most companies. Vessel disease, maybe not so well because we're still learning about uh, vessel disease in, in, uh, in the brain. But luckily in the Western population, um, it's, uh, you know, clots are the primary cause of, of stroke, large vessel occlusion strokes. So we, we really, took um, the clot into, a, into perspective. And um, uh, we think that clots can make a big impact or being able to replicate clots can have a big impact in terms of um, 
uh, understanding these challenges. So, of course, we we started uh, with understanding these clots, just like stroke begins uh, with a clot. Uh, there are a couple of publications in the literature which have extracted stroke clots from patients and analyzed them in very basic histological composition. And when we started in 2010, there, there were none. Uh, of these works that have been that were published, uh, the first one was in 2011, and so slowly we started to get more and more of these publications. But we were able to use this um, uh, the the composition that was published in the literature and kind of create a a graph here that you can see where it captures 100 clots, all of them from these three publications. Uh, retrieved from stroke patients, ordered from highest red cell content to lowest red cell content. And these are very um, early works. So the histological composition is also not very advanced. It's just looking at red cells, uh, fibrin, and white cells. And even in the fibrin, it's not distinguishing platelets. So this, this is probably better termed as fibrin slash platelet composition. And using this, then we, we were able to create protocols that would take into account uh, different environmental conditions, the different compositions, and also see uh, and compare the, 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 the clots and the thrombi retrieved from patients uh, histologically and visually, and then replicate them using animal blood. Now, uh, this was the first of our publication from our lab here in, at, at NTI within Sarah Novus. But this kind of ability for us was very crucial. We developed this very early in 2010, 2011 to be able to replicate these clots as, as closely as possible. And, and that's what really helped us in our, in our early in vitro models. We certainly refined them and kept using them and then eventually published them in this, in this article. But we have, uh, uh, even from this, we've continued to advance our knowledge of clots. Uh, this was pro probably a picture I used to show you know, several years ago. It still, I think, captures the essence of uh, the variation in clots because you can really see this variation. Um, you know, just, just a, an insight here. If, if you ever go back to read the first publication from Dr. David Liebeskind, who is a neurologist at UCLA in, in, uh, in the States, he was the first to kind of look at this composition systematically in, in uh, clots from stroke patients. And the conclusion was that all, clo all clots are nearly the same. They, have, they contain red cells, fibrin, and white cells. And there's some variation here and there, but they're pretty much the same. And, and that kind of uh, uh, thinking, I think, has really moved on from 10 years ago until now. And, and our modeling, I think, has been an important part of this type of uh, uh, advancement in, in understanding. Because only through this visual ability to see all these different clots that were capturing the different compositions, were we really able to ask ourselves, that, that, okay, they might all contain the same stuff, but they certainly look very different. And so does that mean that their behavior is also different? And, and so that uh, led to more in vitro work, which was looking at the wide range of clots. Here is the standard run of the mill kind of clot that's in the middle uh, of the clot composition with a prototype stent retriever in a very simple vessel. Uh, and it's able to just to grab it and pull it out very easily. And probably what has been happening since the first time a device was used to pull out a clot uh, in the brain purposefully, uh, most of these clots that were removed were probably the, the simple and easy ones to remove. Uh, and it's only when we really looked at the, the ends of the spectrum starting from these tougher clots, which are on the low red cell side, we can see that, that the behavior of the clot changes 
It doesn't want to dislodge anymore. It's sticky to the vessel wall and, in, and it doesn't glide at all. It's even rolling. Uh, of course, we're using a silicone vessel. So it's not real endothelium, it's not realistic, but uh, I, th I think what we can understand is that in the same setup, having two different clots behave very differently is a big clue to how different compositions may influence the, the properties of different clots. And then on the other end of the spectrum, uh, with these clots with a high red cell count, whether we're using this technique called aspiration only, or in combination with a stent retriever, what we find is that these clots are quite fragile and they, and they fragment very easily. Uh, and, and so you, you see the fragment on the left and on the right, it's because of the stent retriever pulling into the catheter. So regardless of the technique or the device or how it's used in a very, very similar model, uh, same setup, we see very different behaviors. And, and that is an important clue in understanding how to create a device to, to meet those challenges. Prior to being able to model this type of behavior, all we have is the insight from a physician as to what could be happening. And as you know, a thrombectomy procedure is done blind, meaning that there's only an X-ray of fluoroscopy being done, being used. The clot cannot be visualized, and all they can see is when it comes out in their hands what the clots look like. Uh, so, so there's a lot of unknown in an actual procedure, and coupled with the knowledge of physicians that they bring to the table, and using these in vitro setups to zone in on what's what could be happening was very insightful for us in, uh, in uh, designing a medical device, designing the MO trap that could potentially meet all of these challenges. Another way of looking at uh, these challenges is how they actually lodge. Here, this soft cohesive clot is actually smaller in diameter than the size of the vessel, this M2 vessel, but because of how it folds, it gets stuck into here. Um, this clot is kind of reminds of that fragmentable clot that I showed before, but it's not only when they are removed, but also when they lodge that they may have a chance to fragment. And these really low red cell clots, they also uh, create a different lodging personality or behavior where sometimes in our models, uh, um, they would lodge in the middle of the M1 vessel. In this case, the M1 is not really tapered, very, very slightly tapered if there is any. And, and that's why it, it kind of lodges in the middle there. Going back to the earlier failure that we observed, um, I think it's, it's nice for us to visualize these behaviors and these, um, and these faults that are happening. But something very important for us was to try and quantify this behavior. Uh, it, it's only through the quantification that we can begin to look at different prototypes and see if it's able to overcome this challenge or not. And so in trying to quantify this behavior of, uh, of this very tough looking clot, one of the first things we did was, was uh, just look at the force of friction that this type of clot is causing. Because in a, in, a, in a realistic or a normal situation, the clot is being pushed distally, and there's probably a combination of biological adhesion as well as friction to keep the, to keep the, the clot fragment where it is. And the force of retrieval must overcome all of those forces in, in order for it to pull back. So the force of friction is very clearly visible in a silicone vessel. And so we thought that that had a big role to play. So uh, in a nutshell, the, the, the several years of, re of work to try and quantify it kind of boils down to this slide over here where we use the understanding of the coefficient of friction to create a, a slide table uh, that would uh, 
that would slide the, where the clots could slide down. Uh, and then at the angle that they slid down, we were able to calculate the, the coefficient of friction. This was validated with bovine aorta just to make sure that the surface that's being used in the in vitro model also gives similar results. So you probably, I don't know, maybe most of you have already seen this video, but um, it's, it's published in this, uh, in this article over here. And we see a red cell rich clot on the left and a fibrin rich or, or a red cell poor clot on the right. And very, very clearly, there is a difference in the angle um, when, the, when the clots begin to slide down. And not only that, but even when the clot is already sliding down, it's not really a, uh, a smooth sliding down. It's almost sticky to, to the surface. So this repeatedly done in, a, in the lab environment allowed us to at least understand the nature of this friction. And we were able to, to see that these red cell poor clots indeed have a significantly higher coefficient of friction. And then after a certain point, this coefficient of friction stabilizes and it almost doesn't matter whether it's 20% red cells or 80% red cells, they all just slide down quite quickly uh, or they have a very minimal coefficient of friction. Um, and this was done uh, without any uh, um, uh, difference in how the two clots were at, at a surface level. So the surface area was the same, the weight of the clots and the masses of the clots were kept very similar and, and, and controlled. Uh, and we even had a surface of the in vitro model that was kept hydrated and lubricated so that it would not, uh, if the water was leaking from the fiber enriched clots, that it would not influence the results. So uh, the other aspect to this fail failure of retrieval is, okay, we can begin to appreciate one reason why this clot might not want to retrieve, but after it's been attempted once, what's now happened to the clot? Has it worsened or has it, uh, uh, has, is it the exact same as before? We, we can visually see that it's been compressed so what does this compression do to the clot? And just repeating this simple clot friction experiment, what we were able to see is that depending on how much the clot is compressed, so very little compression here, but clearly something like 50% is being compressed when you look at these images. Uh, so with a decent amount of compression, the coefficient of friction increases a lot. And so every subsequent pass, is probably going to be more difficult to remove. Over the last several years, we have shared this research with lots of physicians who have used the AmboTrap device or indeed any device. And uh, most of the time we get good, quite strong agreement and an understanding that this really could be one of the big reasons why clots are so, some clots are so hard to pull out. And so it was only through this in vitro modeling that we were able to, to uh, gain this better understanding. And of course, what that meant is that, that the EmboTrap device was specifically then designed to um, overcome this problem of trying not to compress, but by trying to or encouraging the clot to move inside the, the device. So this presentation is not, about the, is not a, about the device itself, it's about how we kind of came to this device. And, and I think it, it kind of shows how the in vitro modeling was so useful for us in uh, being able to understand this. So we did not stop at just a one test. We continued to understand this uh, in as much detail as we could. So we've generated a lot of internal in-house understanding of these clots and the challenges they bring and able to advance that knowledge through better modeling, uh, all the time as we are advancing. Um, and, and I think this has really been helpful for us. Uh, and, and we felt a responsibility to uh, share this research as well. And so we continually share, collaborate um, to, to gain better insights. Um, 
some of you know in, in a in a medical device company once a device is designed and developed um, clinical uh, studies become very very important uh, anything clinical um, is uh, is of real value to a physician when they are deciding whether or not to use the device but uh, just something to to keep in mind is that is that while it's important and influential it is not the only thing that uh, gets looked at uh, of course for us the the continual understanding of the clots is very important but also uh, in vitro research into the device itself it can be very useful in setting a device apart from other devices um, and once devices are marketed and competition starts to come then uh, other things need to be understood, like the uh, economic impact of a particular device, to make the argument uh, not just to a physician who's a, who's a customer of the medical device, but to the hospital boards as well, that uh, in order to use the device. So, all in all, I think the ability to model uh, accurately and um, I suppose not not just accurately, but uh, in a way that gives insights um, is very, very helpful uh, because we could create access models that are accurate but are not transparent, for instance. And so their ability to give us insights gets diluted. So, so in the creation of models, a lot of things have to be taken into account that give, uh, and they all must lead to better insights, essentially in why things are working or not working. And replicating these uh, using population-based models, so not just a middle of the road or a median kind of uh, model to represent the majority of people, but actually replicating the challenges is the bit that is uh, 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 extremely helpful. And then quantifying that bit that uh, those um, uh, challenges that are at spectrums, at the ends of the spectrums. I think that's what has really helped us in understanding those uh, insights and then using them to develop the device. Another thing that in vitro modeling helps with is it allows a company, or at least it allows it allowed us to evolve with moving targets. So what what do I mean by this? Uh, you know, probably. You may know that uh, when we started as a company in 2010, at least, maybe if you think back to that kind of um, time frame, uh, you may know that the that there were loads of different technologies being tested and tried in uh, uh, in medical device companies to try and remove these clots purposefully. Uh, it, probably this Mercy coil is the most um, uh, commonly unknown early medical device for thrombectomy. But you can see here, this is one of the first devices from Penumbra. It was essentially a, a guide wire, which was used to jab the clot and make it fragment on purpose so that it, pieces could be sucked out from the catheter below it. Uh, this one uh, was a, in a similar mechanism, but used ultrasound to vibrate the clot and try to help pull it out. All of this uh, was before the era of, this, of the stent retrievers. And that's when we started as a company. And so our target was very, very wide. And, and uh, uh, the in vitro modeling really helped us to test loads of different prototypes that, that were in nobody's mind uh, and, and try to understand how they would work. It was only in 2012 where the first publication or the first clinical trial of Solitaire, I think it was SWIFT at this time, really came out and showed the, the difference of a stent retriever. And then, so, so here, um, actually SWIFT and Trivo, they both uh, were published in 2012. Uh, so I, I, I uh, showed this graph early on but uh, you know, remember that the recanalization um, threshold for what is a good device and what is not a good device was also much lower than what it is right now. It was perhaps 50, 60% uh, 
um, if it can meet that target of recanalization, it's a good device. Also, clinically, the targets were not as high because this type of technology in terms of removing clots, large vessel occlusions from the brain was actually not established. And, and so the clinical um, arm of these trials uh, was, um, uh, it was kind of all over the place. You could see 27%, 25%, but also up to 39 or 58%, a wide range in, uh, in, in, in the clinical outputs. And, and in 2013, I think all medical device companies had a bit of a heart attack or a stroke maybe, you know, with pun intended. But there was this group of trials called the Unhappy Triad, MR Rescue, IMS3, and this synthesis expansion. Three trials that were conducted to show the benefit of thrombectomy, and they all failed to show this benefit. And you can see from this meta-analysis that they, some of them actually favored the control uh, and, and only one of them favored the intervention, but you know, they're, they're pretty much smack in the middle of, of odds ratio of one. So now we have a riskier procedure that, than the drugs used to treat these uh, patients, and they were not successful at all. And this created a, uh, a very tough situation for medical device companies because we had no idea what was in store now after this, uh, this unhappy triad. Uh, but luckily enough, this, this is the big five that now we are always quoting in our publications and referencing the big five trials that proved thrombectomy just one and a half to two years later. And, um, and thankfully they came out because now they're, all of them showed a difference in, uh, uh, in intervention. Um, so here, uh, having the ability to create in vitro models was so useful because uh, as we attempted to be more and more realistic and accurate in our models, we learned and tried to understand why those trials might have failed, why these would have succeeded. Uh, sure, technology has a role to play, but I think as we've shown, the clots and the challenges that they bring also have a role to play. And later on, as time goes on, the the target moves from TIKI 2B to 3, which is good recanalization or successful recanalization, to TIKI 3, which is complete recanalization. Uh, here, studies, oops, sorry, studies show that the MRS outcome of TIKI 3 is significantly better than the MRS outcome of TIKI 2B. And this becomes consistently shown in, uh, in research around the 2017, 2018, Kind of time frame. So this is where the complete removal of the clot um, is now our new target. And luckily enough, we have models where the clots already can fragment so that we can look at how to improve the retention of these fragments in order to get closer and closer to TK3. And now the target is even more uh, strict or confined, it's called the first pass effect. And this is the term we hear in the clinical terminology uh, most often. And it's simply saying, uh, taking the complete clot out in the first pass, because this has certainly shown to be a, an independent marker for better clinical outcome of, of patients as well. So with all these moving targets, we had a very um, similar uh, I don't want to say the same because, of course, we've been continually advancing our models, but the root of it was the same. It's essentially, we had attempted to recreate the variation of the clots, the variation of the axis and the tortuosities, and trying to make realistic pressure environmental conditions. And that allowed us to move with all these evolving and changing targets to, to create better and better devices. Or pro, pro, whether it's prototypes or, or actual devices. Uh, also, for a sustainability point of view, this type of modeling is super helpful uh, as it allows us to generate loads of different ideas. 
when you have good models to test ideas, then uh, uh, if R&D can come up with lots of different ideas, they can be documented, patented, and then it, it creates a sustainable function for the R&D facility where uh, we continually have lots of ideas and they funnel down into better and better ideas than those ones are prototyped. Finally, some of them are selected to, to look at further and then only a handful then get selected to, uh, uh, to actually become products uh, and get chartered. So as we, have, um, as we have grown in the last four or five years in terms of our modeling, uh, all of these have also grown. And the in vitro aspect of our models has I think been our consistent um, way of being able to assess different prototypes, generate different ideas and, and bring them for our company to evaluate. So the, uh, this is my last slide. I kind of go back here to, to the start um, where this is how we have, um, uh, we have designed our process to work in this way, uh, starting from the understanding the clinical unmet need and then creating the device and, and sharing all the insights around it. And you can see the NTI logo and the, and the purple boxes around these two particular parts, something that I think we do very, very well here in Serenovus within NTI, but um, uh, extremely important for us. It's part of our way of making medical devices, of um, innovating in medical devices, and, and, and something that we're, we're very proud of, of having that ability. So. Um, thank you for your time and, and listening. Um, I hope it was interesting. I, I, I tried to pitch it in a way that um, um, people from different backgrounds could understand. So hopefully it was uh, clear. And I hope it wasn't also maybe a rehash of things you've already heard and you already maybe know. So I hope there was something new uh, for you to, to hear. So thanks for your time and uh, I'm open to any questions. Congratulations, Mom, Mahmoud. So may, may I just uh, try to, so, to open the discussion very briefly. Uh, at the beginning, you, you told us that uh, so you can start to imagine a new product. So like do a brainstorming and then so and try to put all your efforts to bring your, your ideas to a real product or something. And this normally takes five, three to five years or something like that. My question is, what do you expect in the next three to five years? So where are we moving? So are we still working or try to optimize a device or a technique or in the stroke area, of course, I'm talking. So what, what do you see that most of the things and efforts will be put? Yeah, that's the million dollar question, <laughs> Francesco. Yes. I, um, I can give you my personal uh, kind of insight. Um, I, I think that the way I look at the literature right now is that still we have uh, no randomized control trial, nothing that tells us here's how to do thrombectomy other than um, use a device, whether it's stent retrieval or aspiration, it's basically telling us, get the clot out as quickly as possible. And I think, I think if we look at other areas in medicine, you know, uh, the heart is a prime example. Um, not only are the devices for myocardial infarction quite well established, but also how to place them, which type of devices to use, whether they should be drug eluting or not, uh, have all been very thoroughly tested and there's much a very confined space now for innovation there because they know very well what works and what doesn't. Here, we don't. And I think that gives us um, lots of opportunities to uh, uh, innovate. And I don't think the innovation has stopped. I think there's going to be, because of the fact that, uh, that we don't have uh, um, 
a very strict guidance as to how to do thrombectomy, I think there's there, we're still looking at innovations in the devices used, in the techniques used, in the ancillary equipment used, and, and also in the patient populations that are maybe not Western patient populations. If we look at, if we look at Asian and uh, uh, populations which have a high ra higher rate of ICAD, um, innovation in those areas is, is, uh, is bound to grow. Uh, and so I think, I think we're, we're gonna continue to see innovation in the actual product uh, startup companies that are going to look at different ways of removing these clots. Um, we have a better target, as I mentioned. It's no longer, ooh, can we get some of the clot out? It's, okay, we know we have to get all of the clot in the first pass. That's our new target. And that kind of limits a little bit of the information, of the, of the innovation. But I think uh, it's, 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 uh, it's still very open. And so we'll, be, we'll continue to see that. Also, um, the fact that the procedure continues to be blind, uh, still a physician going in with a thrombectomy ha has to use a fluoroscopy and can't tell where the clot is unless they inject and only where the injection stops, they can assume that's where the clot is. And then they're, they're blind when they're pulling the clot or, or aspirating the clot. They don't know what's really happening, whether to the vessel or to the clot itself. And so I think imaging over the next, maybe not three to five years, maybe this is a 10 year market, 10 year time frame, will really begin to innovate and improve in giving physicians the ability to see more what is happening inside those vessels, whether it's damage to the vessel, collapse of the vessel, or the clot that's being captured in there. So I think that's that's where things are, are, are heading. It's in, in, um, and that the innovation funnel is still very, very open. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, Beruz. Hi, uh, hi Mahmoud. Thanks uh, for very nice presentation, very useful. And uh, follow on on what uh, Francesco asked. Uh, do you think uh, uh, the future of uh, device design should be one device uh, which can capture all composition? Uh, or clock composition, or we should go through composition a specific device design. And uh, somehow uh, now the composition before the intervention, which one is? I think if, 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 if we're talking about an ideal situation, then the ideal situation is definitely the former, right? You don't want the, the physician to think about which device they should use in which particular circumstance, if we can make a device that, that uh, does all clots uh, well and is um, you know, uh, effective against all types of action, uh, all types of clots and, and uh, tortuosities and behaviors of the vessel, that's definitely ideal. But do I think it's heading that way? No, I don't think it's heading that way because currently, all devices are not able to do that. Each device has a strength and a weakness. And not only the device, but the technique being used with the device has certain strengths and weaknesses. And, and those are being understood. And so because we're in a time frame where this is still being understood, uh, uh, there's, a, there's no way for a device, in my opinion, to be made that does it all. It's only once we've come to a point where we can understand uh, and we have some good uh, data to back it up, you know, uh, images of the clot beforehand, a type of device working, prospectively monitoring how it's doing. And we're saying, yes, that works in this situation. And we can point to reasons why. Then we can begin to coalesce that feedback back again, converge it back into a singular device that captures, that takes all those different design features. So it's kind of the same answer in a different way to the, to the previous question, because the, you know coincides with the fact that the innovation funnel is still open um, because we don't have all of this understanding. And we don't have a control, randomized controller that tells us this is how to do the thrombectomy. So until, until we get there and until we get to a point where we know which device works in which cases and why, we cannot create one device 
for all purposes. Uh, but but I think that one day will come when we have that understanding, then we can converge back again. Thanks. I guess if there's no more questions, then we, I really want to thank you, Mahmoud, for taking the time to give this lecture. I found it really interesting, and I'm sorry that there's not more people to attend. Probably the holiday period uh, doesn't help. But uh, thank you very much for doing this. And I hope uh, at least we, we recorded it, so uh, possibly uh, some will at least look at it at the recorded version. So That's great. Thank you. I appreciate it also, and uh, happy, happy to present during this time. Thanks a lot, Mahmoud. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.